presentation from Data Works titled Who Owns Dome? Durham. Mm, that's interesting. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. How are you? We are well. Hanging in. It's been a long afternoon. Oh, thanks, Amber. Um, I'm going to try to be loud enough with my mask on. Um, if I get not loud enough at any point, just give me a, some kind of sign. To be better. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Amber. Mm -hmm. So let me start with this. All right. Well, okay. So. Um, again, I, I appreciate the time to be able to, to talk with you all. Um, this is a, a presentation that's in response to a request from the mayor to talk a little bit more about information, data, and other, other sort of historical background, contemporary background that's related to affordable housing um, in Durham since we had the chance, or you all had the chance on September 9th, I believe, to have your housing retreat. And there's a big conversation going on currently with you all about affordable housing. And um, this is sort of a, a next way to kind of keep in the rhythm of conversation around that and inform it with some data and some other historical context. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to step into that flow of learning and discussion with y'all and look forward to um, any other way that I can be helpful from the perspective of DataWorks. And um, this presentation briefly is called Who Owns Durham, which is actually a project of DataWorks that goes back to about 2018 and prompted by questions about how our nonprofit affordable, nonprofit affordable housing providers in Durham can actually acquire property at scale when they're trying to compete against uh, out-of-state corporations that buy things out of pocket before they even show up in the market in some cases. So it was a frustrating moment for the nonprofits, but it was an illustrative one for us too because we recognized that the uh, the, this, the type of, of uh, business practice involved in doing this was a pretty um, uh, a problematic one in a lot of ways that wasn't on our radar as much yet. We learned that uh, some of these corporations were uh, typically evicting tenants three times more often than the prior owners were. It opened up a can of worms, and we've been paying too much attention to it ever since. Um, but that's why this is called Who Owns Durham. It belongs to a narrative for us as well. Um, I'm here on behalf of DataWorks NC. Uh, we are a nonprofit based in Durham, North Carolina. Our mission, as you see here, is to democratize data to facilitate empowered and productive and equitable community in Durham. We see that as being done through prioritizing Durham's communities of color, low income, and historical disinvestment. And we do this in collaboration with neighbors, communities, nonprofits, and local agencies that share goals of racial equity and community power. We feel like these are essential pieces of the puzzle for racial equity, and that's uh, how we consider democratization to move forward for our work. So again, um, this is a request that came to us fairly recently, and uh, fortunately, uh, I'm not bringing a set of slides that I worked on over a nine-day period for y'all uh, to, to kind of consume in, a, in this sort of rapid turnaround. This is work that we've been, been, again, digesting, sharing, learning in community with people for years now. And so a lot of what you'll see in this presentation comes from that work. It's work that has been informed by developing the Durham Compass, which you just heard about. It's work that's been informed by work we've done with Bragtown Community Association, Walltown, Merrick Moore, and with tenant groups over the last few years as well. And work we've done with the Public Health Department and others too. It's all sort of in here. So it was easy for me to say, these are the pieces that feel strongest to bring to the conversation at this moment in time. With all of the data that we talk about, anytime we're talking about data in public places or with anybody anywhere, um, we begin presentations taking time to illustrate how data today Maps and charts don't make a full and total representation of the histories that are very present in the statistics all the same. So nothing in today's data points will be what they are without the influence of history. And every one of these representations bears directly on your work, my work, and all of our work in racial equity. And so for us, this also gives DataWorks folks a chance to name a few issues we face in trying to honestly and equitably share statistical data too. It would be uh, irresponsible for us to not to talk about the history that turned it into what it is. So we start by do, do, doing that by observing that we're on and managing in this room too, land that was never ceded to white settlers by the Shikori and Tuscarora people who preceded colonial settlement. And this map that you see is the best geographic representation of that presence that we have right now. From, that's from the Native uh, Land Digital Project based in Canada. 
Moving forward from that, white settlers developed the first comprehensive distribution of land, measuring land closely to establish property ownership, and then a system for managing that ownership. Not unlike the parcel fabric today, the map of land grants covers all of the land of the county. The power of claiming territory with boundaries and names on maps is established for Durham here for the first time. Not long after that, the accumulation of large areas of Durham for agricultural production using enslaved black and indigenous labor became the predominant characteristic of our mapped land. Cameron Benningham plantations, which you see here, were approximately 32,000 acres of Durham, Wake, and Granville counties, uh, with up to 8,000 additional acres in Person County. And it's important to keep in mind that the plantation dominated land use in antebellum times, but also long after. And this, for instance, is an illustration of the extent of Cameron owned lands as of 1890. So the end of slavery on Cameron land led to a foundational period of migration toward and into Durham. But there are other plantation histories in our landscape, such as the Massey Plantation, which is said to have been around where Hope Valley is today, the Rhone Plantation in Eastern Durham, where Merrick Moore is today, and there are others as well that don't have as prominent an image in our minds as Stagville or Farintosh. Property always had rules stratifying us by whether we could legally own land and then how much we might be able to accumulate. When it became illegal to formally zone communities by race in 1917, other privately controlled tools like racially restrictive co covenants were used. This is what you see on this map here. Through the 20s through 1948, that was done legally with the sanction of the, the Supreme Court. Then through the 1960s, it was done as a standard business practice, even by Duke University, who put racial covenants on all of the properties of the Duke Forest subdivisions when they created them to attract elite professors from around the country. They're still part of our landscape today, and they're very difficult to remove. Uh, and what you see in this map is the extent of the presence of those covenants today that we've been able to, uh, to map through the Hacking into History project that we're working on. So those are where we see them uh, coming out. Another generation of, of this um, racialized land practice and the demapping and use of data to endorse it and to, to frame it, greenlining. Other entanglements of law and private lending, private selling were rife in the 20th century. A generation after that racial zoning was made illegal, the homeowners loan corporation risk maps became essential in the iconography of what America's apartheid was and is. Red areas, yes, but blue and green areas just as much. These use data to lock generations of black and other racial ethnic minority groups out of lending, but also to protect and prioritize it in white and upper class neighborhoods. We need to use data to identify the privileging that happened, not simply reproduce anti-black narratives. And for us, it's an important moment to say that uh, the, the focusing on redlining alone in this map overlooks the power of, of that's being transferred in that map as well. A generation after that, city projects doubled down, literally bulldozing black neighborhoods with federal money. We all know this story very, very well. This was a very data intensive process though with a full inventory of housing in, quote, blighted areas that documented the value, profitability, and characteristics of each of the properties that were scheduled to potentially be destroyed. The Durham County Urban Renewal Archives is an excellent resource for learning a lot more about that. It's accessible to all of us in the public library website, and uh, that's where we could go to learn more about how intensive that process was in terms of administrative and data uh, work. So these images right here are from the Bull City 150 Uneven Ground exhibit. And the image on the right is from 1972, when the work of dismantling Haiti was fairly complete. Um, you know, we talk often about the, the destruction of the houses, but an interesting aspect of this, it just drives home how pervasive this was as a raising of a community, was that the, the street network itself was reconfigured as well. Like this was never even a place of, of any human transaction after it was, it was uh, raised and, and scraped and turned into an entirely different real estate. So, Oftentimes in our presentations about how to use the Durham Compass, we'll stop there because the Compass picks up data from 1970 and goes forward. But in thinking about the history that we inherit and that drives a lot of what the information is that we learn about in the Compass, there's, a, there's generations after that too, right? So uh, I say here to myself to remember that um, the, this is uh, drawing out that historical narrative further by acknowledging way too many things on a single slide. Each of these deserves 
uh, much, much greater depth. But you know, in the 1980s, we were still figuring out what was going to happen with the highway cutting through the town. Crest Street is a, a prominent story in how a community fought and, and described itself enough to be treated, taken seriously, and to be saved in a certain way. Its church is still across the highway, but they're there. The master, master tobacco settlement really ended tobacco production in America, and that was one of the things that really hit us, obviously. We worked with the American tobacco town, right? Um, expansion of global free trade, was our other big manufacturing was in textiles. So that was something that really went abroad when global free trade allowed for that. Things like NAFTA and other agreements that allowed the workers in these sectors that were our anchors to be elsewhere for, a lot, uh, for much cheaper labor. The demolition of few gardens in Fayetteville Street projects, this is another sort of uh, deep, deep part of the, 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 we talked just now about what happened with Haiti, right? These are also very dense communities of hundreds of people that lived together for a long time, both of these projects, few gardens in Fayetteville Street, and they were no longer there. County use of eminent domain to build a jail in the courthouse. This has just recently come to my attention too, but the way that we've used the tools of our, our development of our, of our community to do massive and, and large scale prominent investments that, uh, that are part of our downtown reconfiguring. Southwest Central Durham quality of life, again, community life things. This is really where there was a lot in the last couple of decades of powerful, powerful work being done in neighborhoods. In Northeast Central Durham, the city was really deeply engaged in this too, was creating the Northeast Central Durham Leadership Council. How do we bolster the community? How do we do that? How do we engage in their planning? Southside redevelopment is another one of these major, major investments in time and energy and resources that's happened in recent years. And 751 South, I don't want to switch the slide as I say 751 South, but I did. Um, that's a major project that happened that you all probably still remember very well, and it ripples through the way we think of possibilities, I think, in terms of real estate in this town. In the 1980s through 2000s, I want to just draw attention to a couple of things here that really reference how we are the beneficiaries, the recipients, carrying the legacy of our investments over the last couple of decades, too. Um, so this slide references some landmarks of the last 30 years or so that helped build the foundation of our current reality. We often listen to narratives of our current time and the struggles we live through as rather out of our control. Uh, the housing market, the state legislature, we can't change capitalism. These are things that we're hemmed in by, or these are landscapes that are structural and we don't have any influence over. But it would be remiss to not also acknowledge how much our public institutions invested in these things that we're going through. And it was risky and difficult decisions were made. On the last point that you see here, I'll go through these actually briefly. So in 1990, you probably all very well know there was a public vote, a bond referendum that voted against funding the baseball stadium reversed by issuing the certificates of participation that invested in the stadium, uh, that made the stadium uh, financing possible. In 1993, Downtown Durham Inc. was created to catalyze downtown investment. And in the late 1990s, the planning department decommissioned its small area planning. And in an interview, interview I did with Steve Medlin in 2008, he said to be, that was done to be more responsive to the needs of the developer community. And that was realized to have been short-sighted at that time. Uh, 14 years ago. In the early 2000s, American Tobacco was redeveloped. That was also a major public investment, too. We put $14 million, I think, into the creation of the parking deck to, to make that project happen there. And in the last decade or so, the Innovation District is another one of these landmark downtown investments. So in, uh, by, you know, by 2011, we were noticed as a place for people all over the world with anywhere to go to be. So it, in the New York Times in 2011, this is a slide from years and years and years ago now. We've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, in, in 2011, New York Times published Durham as the 35th of 41 places in the world to go visit because of things like Scratch Bakery. Um, the, the way that the story of Durham was being disseminated around the world was, a, was one that didn't line up with what Durham's people lived through, right? And it was only a few years after that, 2016, that it was also getting this, this, that part of the narrative of what was not lining up. Who wasn't really invited into this narrative of what we were becoming uh, was getting attention as well. The Atlantic published this article, The Downside of Durham's Rebirth. Talked to a lot of people that we know in the community who are still here. And um, that's, that's another side of this, where people who have been here through this are being pushed out by it, don't feel like they have anywhere to go compared to people with anywhere to go coming here to visit for fun. 
And that, that tension of that experience is one that you all deal with every day, I know. And it's certainly one that is hard to describe with statistics. So uh, we have, as a community, been clear that Durham's people need more control over public resources and they should start with racial and class equity in our wellness, wealth, and safety. And these are a few prominent examples that I want to acknowledge that point in the direction of managing the impacts of gentrification as well and some of its more violent edges. And these are, we've heard about some of this today, really important programming that's responsive to those tensions that I just described too. Participatory budgeting, certainly aspiring to be in that place of community control over what we invest in. Bull City United as well, how do we have a perspective of what wellness is, is a response to, to working through community violence. Um, and eviction diversion, how do we keep people out of that chain, that cycle of devastating, uh, like social, well, health, uh, in, like economic, housing devastation that somebody experiences by having an eviction on their record. And forever home, basic income, uh, the uh, unarmed crisis response work, all of these things kind of fit into the space of how does a, a local institution do work that invests in that wellness, that quality of life in a way that's actually for everyone. So that's, that's the background, that's the landscape that the data lay on in a certain kind of way. So I'll launch into a little bit about that. Um, this is just to show that over the last decade, uh, demographically, we've changed a little bit. Um, bear with me a second. We've increased in population by about 21%, which is pretty normal for the last few decades, actually. The largest increase in population over a, a single decade in recent, the last 40, 50 years, was actually from 1990 to 2000, when it increased by 23%. So this isn't a wild change in population for us. Um, the percentages you can see here are pretty straightforward in terms of which demographic groups grew the most. Um, which you can see Asian is 46%, uh, um, Hispanic, Latinx, 39%, so on. The group that's now def defining themselves, identifying as more than one race is a, a really large increase, obviously 246%. Um, how does that compare, though, to the state and to the nation? And uh, one of the big takeaways here is while we've grown about uh, 57,000 people in the last 10 years, uh, what's a little bit distinctive about our changes is really, um, you can see here that the purple, dark purple bars are Durham, the pink bars or lavender bars are NC, and blue is the United States, that um, in terms of total population, we've grown more than most places have. Um, but in terms of the demographics of that, what really stands out is that we've grown um, less in terms of Asian population, but that we've actually grown a lot more in terms of white population compared to the other parts of the, in the North Carolina or the nation. In the national context, the US uh, shrunk. The white population is negative 2.6% over the last decades, and we're up 18.7%. And that seems like a, an interesting takeaway from this too. It's probably the most you know, significant piece of this change demographically from the census that just came out. Who was moving to Durham? So this is, um, the handle on this is really from the American Community Survey. Households uh, making the per percentage of their income as compared to uh, the poverty level, uh, which was just a way to, to look at household income levels by the number of households and the, the new ones that have uh, come to our community. For reference, you can see what those federal poverty levels are on the right. One person households, not, still not quite $13,000 a year. You know, the poverty uh, designation by the federal government is, um, you know, uh, painfully inadequate. Um, but this is what we have to, to look at in this particular table. And the thing that I think is most uh, sort of important to take away from this is that most of the growth in our population, 90% of it has been in that 300% of poverty rate and up. 72%, 73% here is the people making five times the poverty rate, the largest income bracket really, the highest income bracket. So people making five times the poverty rate, which is a middle class salary um, and above. So the highest bracket of all income households is where we've had most of our growth. And that category now is about 40% of our population in the county. So uh, just to make a note as well too, that in looking at this frame of 
poverty level and percentage of poverty level for household income is really just a way of, of proxying like the categories of the economic categories of who we are, like how, household wise, how much money are people making that are moving here? It's not a suggestion of using that for any other standard of affordability or anything. Median home buyer incomes are another way of looking at this. So what you see here is for the entire county and the median income for home buyers, folks that get a mortgage move into a place to be an owner occupant. This is not for landlords buying a place or investors. This is people moving into neighborhoods in Durham. And you can see there's been a general increase in that median household income over the last 15 years or so. But across the board, what has stayed steady throughout is the gap between households by demographics. So uh, it just you know, pointing out the obvious here that you can see that the white households moving into Durham are making a little over $100,000 median. Half of them make more, half of them make less. And for black households moving to Durham, that that's somewhere closer to $65,000. Um, and the same sort of distribution of those numbers by race and demographic, um, uh, by types, by, by folks, is, um, is kind of persistent across all of the disaggregated information we look at. This is true even for the relatively higher income people buying houses in Durham today, which is what you see here. And one other thing to point out here is that this is not hitting all parts of Durham in the same way, of course, right? I'll make one example, Southside, the median household income in 2017 for folks that lived there at that time was $16,000. Um, the median home buyer income that year and in each successive year was over $100,000. So within two years, the median household income in Southside tripled. So if you looked at that number, it went from 16,000 to 48,000. Like, what does that really mean? Well, it's because that everybody that's been moving there is making $100,000 or more, or you know, half of them make more, half of them make less. So 68% of the folks in 2019, 2021, just last year, that moved to Southside are white folks. 9% are black, 4% are Latinx, and one, less than 1% are Asian. 15 or so percent didn't elect to include their race, race or demographic information in their mortgages or in the published data about their mortgages. But in that year, last year, uh, 2021, the median home buyer income across all those folks was $109,000 in Southside. Um, so that's just a, an indication, of, a, a suggestion of what the dynamic is. Again, that tension economically of change in neighborhoods in Durham. And people are moving here every day. So in such a period of rapid and damaging gentrification as this, all the great things said, we're also gonna say that it's a damaging process. Our institutions have been discussing and planning a great deal for these 20 or 30 people coming here every day. This is a, a, a common narrative. We've listened to it and talked about it for a long time. People coming here 20 or 30 a day. And it's a great number to have in hand when we're thinking about the agenda of growth, the economic growth, and how to prepare for that and for real estate development. So we need to have more construction and high-wage jobs. We also have to have houses built and jobs ready for people that don't want to be here. But it's a very problematic number because it masks every one of our community that we lose on the other side of the equation. And there was no handle for that. So we've oriented our community planning to serve the newest person in the room effectively by using that number, relying on that, while the rest of the community is trying to deal with these historical trends that we've talked about and trying to pay their rent and their taxes or find a home. So you can see just from this most current data that the truth about migration is a lot more complicated. So just in this case, um, from 20, between 2018 and 2019, uh, people coming to Durham every day were 57.2, people leaving every day, 58. Households, 36 and a half, people leaving, 34.3. Households leaving were 34.3. So there's a net gain, we, we're not arguing about that. But it's an important thing to recognize that people also leave in large numbers for all kinds of reasons too. And that's an important part of this. Some are being displaced, some are graduating from Duke, some are moving elsewhere for other jobs and so on, or joining family where they are, moving back home because of the pandemic. Whatever the case might be, there's another side of the migration story. John, sorry, can I interrupt you just on this slide? Please do. You have fewer people coming to Durham every day than leaving. So that's not gonna cause population growth. Right, you wouldn't expect that, right. So this is from the IRS, uh, the county to county migration data. And the interpretation that I have of this is that it's the household sizes that are making up for that in some way. 
Um, there's more to it, I'm sure, as well. Folks that are maybe not reporting taxes um, or in the same, maybe they're not showing up by filing taxes. But I think really the, the growth here is in that household number, in aggregate being uh, somewhat larger families than those leaving. And it's also where the net increase is just by comparing leaving versus arriving here. Okay. But the people are in households, right? The data set should be? Individual filers, and then the other is household filers. So these are two separate categories of that data set. If you can imagine all file, people filing taxes, they're households, they're individuals, and together they are the complete 100%. So of those that are household filing, gotcha. like joint filers, that's what that second row is. Uh, okay. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, it might not make total sense. I, I recognize that too. Yeah. Okay. So, so people means individuals. That's right. Like, like If you filed as an individual. Uh huh. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I will. I will look into this data a little bit more. Do you? Do you already have a calculation of what that? Of like what the actual number would be for a year? What was it? Can you say that last part again? Do you have a calculation for what the number? It, an increase in population as predicted by this data for a year? For any given year? For, for say, 2019, if you take average household size, turn that into humans, add these humans, sub add, subtract, and multiply by 12. <laughs> no, but that's a great yeah. exercise to think through, right? Like, we, yeah. that, that could be done, and it might be an estimate that starts to explain a little bit more. Um, but it hasn't, it's not part of this, and I haven't really done that now. Okay, yeah, because this just, this seems weird. But. Fair enough. Yeah, thanks for the great question. Though. So how has housing supply changed? Over the last 12 years, we've added a lot of new homes. Um, looking only at newly subdivided parcels for one, two, three, and four family homes, there's been a 10,000 unit increase since 2010. So in 2010, there were 66,000 parcels. This is just parcels. We're not talking about apartment buildings or anything. Um, 66,000 parcels that were one, two, three, or four family um, homes. In 2022, as of May of this current year, that's 76,000. So again, a 10,000 unit increase just in terms of those parcels being added to our, our community, newly developed places. And that doesn't include apartment buildings, obviously. But the number of people per unit um, is what this slide is really showing you. So in 2000, um, the growth in housing was comparable. It was the same uh, as the growth in population. In 20, and that's over the prior decade. So in 2010, there had been um, more growth in housing than there was in population. And by this decade, we're a little bit behind in terms of the the growth in housing as compared to the growth in population. And that's 2.23 compared to 2.25 in 2010. So it's, it's a little bit marginal. It's like, what does that really translate to? A similar question, perhaps, is what we just talked about. Um, but what we don't really have here, I mean, that, that, I'm just acknowledging that's not a massive shift that would explain like a large gap in our supply, so to speak, right? Um, but it's the data that we get from the Census Bureau that can plug into this. John, the source, what's this, this, is this from the Census Bureau? This That's from slide? the Census Bureau, yeah, occupied households. Okay. Yeah, and the total population. Um, so what we don't have, though, is good local data on vacancy, which would allow us to understand to what extent there's a shortage in housing overall and maybe access to units that aren't being leased and things like that, which is uh, a, a painful gap in knowledge, I think, for us, too, in a lot of ways. We can uh, casually observe that there might be vac vac and higher vacancy rates in even newly constructed buildings, older ones as well, but we just don't know that, and it seems like an important piece of the puzzle. So corporate investment, like I mentioned early on, and this is a very, I'll start off with a very generalized reference to what corporate investment is here too, and I feel like there are valid uh, critiques of like using everything as an LLC or something like that, right, in terms of corporate. So we'll talk also about out-of-state ownership briefly. But we came into this project of Who Owns Durham thinking specifically about corporate investment firms that were sort of this financialized property model where it's an acquisition that goes into a portfolio. It's not locally managed. It's one of many, 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 many buildings on a large 
um, you know, collection of portfolios, the performance of which is not really front and center to even the managers of it. And the out full uh, leasing up of all the units is actually itself not necessarily a high priority because it's a property to be flipped within a couple of years. And that happened time and again from 2016 through 2017, 18. Whole companies like Atrium, which are um, Artesia rather, which bought five or six properties in 2016 around Lakewood, they came and went in two years and they weren't even here anymore. So stuff like that was happening. So it prompted us to look at just corporate ownership in general in certain ways. And it's gotten a lot of news in the last couple of years. You've seen it in the business journal, you've seen it elsewhere. Um, so as of this past year, 15% of all homes sold in Durham were sold to, uh, to investors. And that includes here, um, we are talking about uh, corporate investors including limited liability corporations, limited partnerships, trusts, and other companies purchasing homes to make money from them, whether collecting rent or selling the property at a profit. Um, that's a very broad definition I recognize. But um, so yeah, as you can see here, 15% of all homes in 20, between 2020 and 2021 were sold to investors. Most of those uh, were used as rental properties. Some of them are, again, these iBuyers, uh, companies that were, you know, that do manage portfolios, manage um, housing as sort of like a, a software service. Um, corporate investment concentrated mostly, though, in predominantly black neighborhoods. And you can see that that's what this map really shows you. The number of corporate purchases per 100 homes. And that's uh, in the darkest blue shading on that map. That's Grant Street area and around Central. And that's 3.4 to 4.8 uh, homes for every 100 in the neighborhood that are corporate owned. So you can see just that there is a dis uh, there's an uh, inequitable distribution of where this is happening as well. And I, I said also that this out-of-state ownership lens is another way of looking at this. This is information that's in the Durham Compass now. You can look at out-of-state ownership of residential properties, but also of, of all properties uh, in a particular community. And this is just, again, another proxy of saying that the control of that property is, is not local. It's been increasing a lot over the last few years, as you can see here. Um, and that's having a, a, another impact on what level of influence in a neighborhood is coming from folks with much different economic interests than the ones who live around these properties. And just another little side note too about this, that you see this show up a lot in apartment complexes, maybe too, and there's been a very, very rapid exponential increase in the sale values of apartment complexes, grade B, C class, apartment buildings, um, like you see around Leon Street or in like Meriwether Drive. These apartment buildings that are selling for like $42 million, I think Mer I said Meriwether Apartments is an example of this, I think, um, where I think they sold for $42 million recently, and that's, that's coming close to the sale value of the 15 middle floors of one city center, right? So um, there is a, a really inflated uh, sale value that exponentially grows. It's like you know, 10, $20 million more each time it sells every few years. At what point is that so far beyond the tax value? And um, at what point does that, is that something that becomes a write-off on a um, or short sale, like things we saw 10, 15 years ago too in the last real estate bubble burst? Um, so there's, I think, kind of like just a really important thing to pay attention there as well. What's happening with the way investment properties, especially apartment buildings, are, um, are, are dangerously out of, of control in terms of their prices. Um, so I'll keep going. From 2000 to 2018, how did Durham's people manage the increased cost of housing here? This is sort of a bigger question about this. And again, questions that we're not here to deliver necessarily answers in, in all these cases. Sometimes these are just tensions. Um, but uh, what we see here is number one, manufacturing jobs decreased by almost 40% over that 18 years. We've already talked about that a little bit. The number of food service and accommodation jobs is actually the largest growth that happened during that period of time then too. 69% uh, increase in terms of the number of jobs in food service and accommodation in Durham. Healthcare positions also grew a lot, 41%. We're gonna talk about that in a minute though. Average weekly wages for people in food service jobs in that 18 years, when you adjust for inflation, decreased. They were $390 a week in 2000, 381 in 2018. And this is just before, you know, a couple years before the pandemic started here. Average weekly wages for retail workers were 566 in the year 2000 and 573 in 2018. That, the, the increase of cost of living here obviously is not reflected in that information. To update that a little bit, since 2018, manufacturing jobs have increased some, 
Um, this is, a, a, I think, a story, too, of some of the, the kind of better opportunities of manufacturing work that's part of our landscape now, too, with like pharmaceuticals and other technological production, too. So there's, um, there's that side of the story. Retail jobs dropped by 1,000 during the pandemic, and that food service jobs during the pandemic dropped by 4,000. Healthcare jobs have actually increased to about 40,000 uh, jobs in our community. And I'm gonna keep moving to kind of stay relatively timely with you all. But this is the health sector. And this, th these data points aren't published anymore by the Department of Commerce. I think it's, at this point, it's redacted information because the sector is so completely owned by Duke University, Duke Health System, um, and the, the components of that, that they don't actually disclose those stats on their site right now. But as of 2018, this is what we can see. So the largest sector in our community, uh, the number of jobs increased by 64% in this sector. And uh, what you see is pretty straightforward here, that the similar to retail and uh, food service jobs, flat or declining wages over that period of time for nurses, people working in senior care nursing homes, same thing for family care, vocational rehab, child care, et cetera. And then within the health sector, at the high end, surgeon specialists growing their incomes, again, inflation adjusted here, and uh, people in home health, outpatient care, um, the larger, uh, the, the higher uh, income professions actually saw an increase in their wages. So this is weekly wages compared to the median gross rent at the time. Um, and you can see who's able to, to keep up with that. Rents in Durham have skyrocketed during the pandemic. And this is like, a, should anybody ever say skyrocketed in a presentation and be, um, and be okay with it? I think it's okay to do that a little bit right now. Um, so, pretty much everybody knows about this story. It's, it's, uh, what, it's on everybody's mind in their life. Um, how much has that really happened? This is coming from data that we scraped over the last uh, five, six years now from Craigslist and PadMapper. It includes new listings and older uh, properties as well. Uh, and it's not, uh, it doesn't reflect people's current rents who are not seeking to move or you know, properties that aren't on the market. It's not in here, these are listings. But um, the chart shows the median cost of housing broken up by the number of bedrooms in the house through the first year of the pandemic. The most remarkable thing about rent price trends shown here is that while rents have been steadily increasing for years, they increased dramatically since the beginning of the pandemic, like literally in March, April of 2020, this is what happened. Um, and so this comes at a point in time at, when 69% of Durham renting households were earning less than 80% of the area median income too. That's actually from 2017 from prior work that we did using public use microdata to show that, you know, that most people who were rent in Durham as of 2017 were people making 80% or less than, than the median income. Uh, another way of looking at this is to see the median rents for each month. And then the blue line on here shows you when the pandemic, the first cases of COVID-19 happened in Durham in March uh, 2012, 2020. And the median list, rent listings for each month prior to that, it's, it's fairly clear, were in the 1,000 to 1,100 range. And as soon as the pandemic started, this happened where these listings uh, were increasing, you know, 50, 30, um, 25, 30% in some cases. But this is something actually, if we were to look right now at the HUD uh, dashboard for voucher projects as well, for voucher properties, the same thing happened. You'd see the same trend there, which I think is a fascinating piece of, of information too. That's not in this slide deck. It's something I discovered recently by looking at their dashboard. I just wanna put it out there because it seems like it's pervasive across rental properties, regardless of whether they're subsidized or not. Evictions, obviously, we talk a lot about evictions and, and trying to prevent them. Um, in a typical year, Durham landlords have been filing about 1,000 a month in the, the, the few years before 2020. Uh, 2020 and 2021 were, were phenomenally different years. Uh, there were federal and state moratoria that, uh, based on failure to pay, you couldn't um, evict tenants uh, for that period of time, for a long period of time there, and you can see what that did to the numbers. It kept evictions at a very, very low rate for a long time, a very positive an uh, inspiring kind of moment in time, actually. But um, that's ceased since the moratorium ended. And then uh, what had happened after the moratorium, obviously we had two rounds of emergency rental assistance as well, uh, which sort of come on both sides of that purple dotted line there where the moratorium ended. 
but you can see what's been happening is a steady increase toward the, the prior trend. We're still lower than that, but in the last month, 611 evictions were filed. Um, we're getting back to that comparable range, you can see, of what the prior years were like. And even though there are far fewer evictions, just a few uh, landlords do crop up a lot. And even during the pandemic, there were some that uh, evicted folks in large numbers monthly. And that's um, something that you know, we've, we've written a lot about through our newsletters over the last two years. Um, and it's been local landlords as well since the, um, the moratorium ended and those larger corporate um, enterprises as well. Our, our partner, Ahmad Bankson, who's more, he'd been working with us for a while, made this chart um, to talk about how this is impacting different communities differently. So we look at the disparity in evictions based on highly segregated ge geography, where people are 66 or percent or more people of color. In a given month, between 65 and 75 percent of evictions happen in, in census blocks that are two-thirds or more people of color. A census block is a really small area compared to what we're talking about in like tracks and things like that. We're talking about like one census tra a census block, for example, is Duke Manor, and it, it's small areas, right? So 66% or more people of color, there are 75% of the evictions happening. Since 2017, if you're looking at half the population or more being people of color, it's 88%. And in, on the other side of this, as a point of comparison, that 2.6% of evictions have happened in predominantly white communities that are two thirds or more white. I'm getting close to my last bits for y'all, and I, I appreciate your, your time and, um, and patience on, um, on some of this stuff. And I realize also that this stuff hits in certain ways, and there's not a lot of breath right now. Um, and that's something that, that's a tension that I think we all kind of feel and carry in a lot of ways, and it's probably um, hard and um, provocative in certain ways too, and that's something that time is um, at odds with sometimes. So um, just a recognition as well that I find this content highly emotional, and I know you do too, and I think everybody should. Um, it's a, as a, a relatively comfortable person, I think the discomfort of it is, is actually important, and I offer that discomfort to anybody who, who finds that they're not discomforted yet. Um, so what do affordable rents look like? When we shared slides, about affordability with the Affordable Housing Implementation Committee, this was a, a really important takeaway for that group, one of the most from the whole presentation. And it's been a primary takeaway of our work with the Bragtown Community Association and also from the Walltown residents too. We think all future projects should look at this and consider this. If we're building housing for poor and working class people in Durham, we should look at this. So this is, we've talked a lot about recently, I think all of us are, are thinking about the area median income and have that awareness now that it includes Chapel Hill as well. And as of the uh, most recent HUD numbers, you see on the far left there, 100% of the area median income is $86,000. Durham County's median household income was $58,000 at that time. And the median household income in Bragtown was $33,000. So relatively comparable, the area median income, 30% of the area median income is much closer to uh, you know, the median household income in Bragtown is actually very close to the 80% median area, median income in Bragtown. But the point of this came down to just looking at what would those rents actually be? What would be affordable for those folks, people making those household incomes? So for Durham, Durham Chapel Hill AMI, 80% is a $1,700 a month rent. For people that are making 60% of that AMI, it's a $1,300 a monthly rent. It's not until you get down to that 30% that you see something, I mean, half of that, you know, $648. If we're gonna even just look at Durham County, the 60% AMI is $873. You see, it start to see this gap here. Um, at the top end of that, 100%, somebody making the median household income in Durham would pay $1,455, whereas the AMI would accept, would, would propose that, that it would be $2,000, $2, a little bit more would be affordable. Um, so this framing affordability for households around this AMI number is, is challenging, is difficult. And especially for people, let's say we're talking about putting a project in Bragtown and we want people in Bragtown to live there, right? Maybe you're thinking about them moving out of Oxford Manor into a place of their own that's, I don't know, down the street or something. Newly affordable housing in Bragtown, important topic. What could they afford? Um, so just by the AMI standards, we're talking about 674 for folks in Bragtown that make 80% of their median income. People that are not the median income for Bragtown, 
And we're getting down to by 30% of that Bragtown median income, we're talking about $253 a month, which is what people who, work, who live in DHA properties are paying for rent every month. So DHA properties and public housing in particular, I'm just gonna take a moment to talk about this. I won't say a whole lot about what's on this slide actually, but it's there for you to look at. These are all the public housing projects, uh, properties in uh, Durham right now, and the most recent inspection scores and the date of those scores. Median rents, as I said, paid by DHA tenants are in the low $200. So scores less than 80, 80 require annual inspections per HUD rules, and a failing inspection score is 59 or less. We talk often about issues caused by supply not meeting demand and how this drives a shortage which keeps people from buying or renting homes here. The story of how many people move here each day relates to this. How are we going to house everyone who wants to live in Durham? But what better expression of the demand that we truly know about than what we see here and what we know about our own public housing? It's not a demand induced by our efforts to attract new residents or corporate headquarters. It's a demand of our own current and in many cases longtime neighbors who are trying against serious challenges to stay here. What I'm saying is that there is a 3,489 person waiting list for DHA units right now and an 8,000 person waiting list for choice vouchers. Um, acknowledging that there's sometimes duplication in the, the, uh, the wait lists, people applying to different properties. Uh, but that's a, that's a number. That's a specific number of people, right? And what we don't know about people moving here from other places in the world that like what they see about Durham, we don't know how many there are, we want them. But we know right now that there's 11,000 or more people here in these lists. And they wanna get into these properties. So these families and individuals are Durham people who need more homes with median rents in the 200s. Pretty simple um, takeaway from that slide in, in my perspective. I'm just gonna throw a couple more pieces out here before I, I try to wrap up. These are slides that come from a presentation that we did as, as DataWorks about the failures of data. I would be wrong to not talk about the failures of data and that they can often just completely emit whole communities. So this is uh, the um, Few Gardens property in, as you can see, February 2004. Our institutions, all of them, are, are in the business of both raising and creating a new whole community. So we've done this, we do this. It's, it's an important piece of our reality. Um, so Few Gardens in February 2004, Few Gardens in May of 2004. We could show similar images of Southside. Maybe recently Northgate Mall was feeling like a thing like this potentially, like what's gonna happen? Uh, and it's a recurring feature of our community. We have various ways of either talking about it or not talking about it, but it's there, it's in the middle of us. What happens is it gets into to collected pieces of news bits, right? We don't have, uh, the problem with like, trying to track down what the story is here, right? So uh, WRAL, one of the Durham's, Durham's eyesores, soon will be history. Uh, demolition of Few Gardens, the city's oldest housing project underway. People came out to th Thursday to watch. They even had a little cake to celebrate. And the families who used to live here in Few Gardens have been relocated. Um, the problem will be gone and it won't have to be an issue anymore. The families have been relocated. For us, as we talk about people and data, there's a big problem here that I need to just address as well. Where did people go? Under what conditions? Are they okay? The story's not over, right? Uh, there are references to crime statistics, broken windows kind of perspective on what was going on that made it an eyesore that people didn't want to live with. And what data are doing in those narratives though is unclear if they drop the story before its full conclusion. We wanna know that the people are safe. We wanna know that they're okay. They're still in Durham and they're doing better than they did previously. So who, the decision is made for who if we don't follow up with that conclusion. And there are even contested stories obviously about Few Gardens itself. So with the erasure of those resident voices, a story is cast as an intervention but we don't understand if it solved the problem. And this is an example that is in public media from Jeffrey Harris. This is in the Durham uh, Voice. It broke my heart, it killed me because everything we touched was destroyed. Where I lived, my schools, everything that showed that I existed, the city government got rid of it. That's one man's perspective. And it's an important one because we talk about data points all the time and we'd be tremendously remiss to not include the voices of folks who aren't at a podium in front of city council talking about this. Um, and we talk a lot about 
units, things we can measure. I can measure buildings. I can measure the number of them. I can't measure that story. I can't tell you the pain that lives in this community. That's what I'm trying to deliver here a little bit. And my participation in the fray of data that you all consume, I can't admit the reality of this person individually right now. So reflections, and this is something that also wraps up all of our housing presentations for the Community Advisory, Citizens Advisory Commission and Affordable Housing Implementation Committee and so on. To what extent is there a housing shortage? We don't know about vacancy is one of the key takeaways to me. I wish I knew better. Who owns rental housing now? Who should own rental housing? It's okay to ask who should too, I think. What is a more appropriate standard for affordability than those we rely on? So the Metro AMI, the standards that set home rents and federal poverty standards, all of that. Like what should we choose to do based on what we think our outcomes should be for the people we wanna protect the most? And what can Durham do to stop evictions and address the underlying issues driving unaffordability? Because down at the bottom of this, there is a churn of displacement that um, isn't being addressed. It was for a little while with that moratorium. And then finally, what would a long game, we've, we've planned a lot in big, like really, really large scale, like generational investments and changes in our community, but what would it look like for a long game that provides security of tenure to poor and working class Durham's, Durhamites? What would that look like? And affordab affordability always leaves that question of for who, right? Let's name for who and, and, and make it happen, I think is kind of what we think of often in these gaps that data leave for us. And affordability is a very imprecise thing for data mines. So I'll just leave it there. And uh, thank you again for all your time. I know it's late. And um, if there's time for questions, I'm glad to, to field or, or wait until another time. But that's what I have brought for you all today. Finally, though, um, these slides, I have notes for all of them. Folks have given me feedback on them over the last few days. Um, and I will uh, share that Google slide version of this that has the notes in it for you all to have in your pockets if you think there's anything useful in here to, to kind of plug into that narrative that you're working on from the retreat, uh, you'll have it in your hands. Thanks for your time. Thanks, John, so much for that. Um, one of those times where I'm at a sort of a loss for words when you start talking about you're gonna do a deep dive in the housing and now we've actually dived in, it is, um, very sobering for that first time. Um, I just want us to just kind of leave it there for us to think about and we can have some discussions further. Um, and so we will now move to